Now we just want to get back at him. In the big house, Michigan has owned Ohio State. Can Trestle win with a backup instead of Belisari? After the disappointment is over, um, you, know, you have to put that behind you and start thinking of solutions. Football star, husband, father. This quarterback can cook, too. I only have about two dishes that I can do. I can do spaghetti and warm spaghetti. College game day serves up rivalry week. Part two, next. College Game Day is presented by Discover Card, proud sponsor of college football's premier pregame show. Well, last night's Bedlam in Boulder with repercussions everywhere that BCS title contenders exist. There is the shocking final score. A funny thing happened on the road to the Big Red rematch in Big D. Happy Thanksgiving weekend. Welcome to College Game Day, home for the holidays. Chris Fowler, Lee Corso, and Kirk Herbstreet. As stunning a game as we've ever seen, something I think we never thought we'd see, a Nebraska team just physically manhandled and run over. We'll get to that in just a second. You get a Colorado team fueled by five straight excruciatingly close losses to Nebraska, issued a bit of a challenge. They said that we play power football. We're going to come right at Nebraska and challenge them the way nobody has. Big Red certainly not up to the challenge of Folsom Field yesterday. They arrived number one of the BCS with perhaps the Heisman frontrunner in Eric Crouch. But in the scoreless game, Buffalo strike first. Little misdirection. Bobby Purify exploding up the middle. No linebackers, no safeties. Early lead for the Buffs, Lee. No nothing. Wayne Lucier. Watch the center. Watch him come up right here. Bounce off of one man. Makes the block on the linebacker. Tremendous blocking by the offensive line of Colorado. CU's defense made some big plays early. Kirk also helped by this critical fumble by Darren Dietrich. A lot of emotion in this game early. The Colorado defense flying around, and this is exactly what they wanted to do. Capitalize on a turnover, and they'll get that opportunity after this. Craig Oak still injured, so the senior backup, Bobby Pesavento, to a future NFL tight end, Daniel Graham. They couldn't cover him all day. Well, uh, There's an argument around the country who has the best tight end in a great year. Daniel Graham oh. stated his case Forget yesterday. Forget about it. Chris Brown, number three in the depth Charted tail back the former Northwestern running back who came with Gary Barnett. Look at the blocking up front, though. Again, the blocking up front. The linemen are doing a good job. I want to know where the safeties were all day yesterday for Nebraska. It wasn't just the linebackers. Where were the safeties? And Lee, look at the poise of Pesavento. Here's Derek McCoy again, just running pretty free. What they did is they crossed Pete against man-for-man -man coverage, and they gave the receiver McCoy a chance to rub off. Is that the Nebraska defense? Brown just standing up, just walks in the end zone against the vaunted black shirts. Then Nebraska's offense would get going. Darren Dietrich fakes the pitch, races into the end zone. They missed the PAT, but the Huskers back within 19. Plenty of time to go before halftime. It was a 35-16 game when Brown, who had eight yards in the previous three games combined, rushes 36 yards for his third touchdown. Uh, you'll see the linebackers get caught up. This is just a simple counter. It's nothing fancy. The backside guard and tackle come around. They pin him. Linebacker, look at Willie Amos, who's coming up as a safety. You think he wanted anything to do with uh, Chris Brown on that play? Nebraska had momentum at the goal line. Dietrich tries to go up and over. He fumbles. This is the third quarter, and the Huskers are making a run. Now, they got the ball back, however, and score. Eric Crouch keeping it on the option. All of a sudden, about four minutes to play in the third quarter, it's a 12-point game. CU in trouble. Huskers with momentum. But then Colorado goes on a 93-yard drive. They just sucked the will out of Nebraska's defense. Brown with another touchdown. Had things in command. And then Eric Crouch, when you have to kind of grab yeah. back for Nebraska, you got trouble. But when you get down big like this, and they are in obvious passing situations, they're in trouble. Lewis, one of the best safeties in the country, makes the big play for the Bucs. This is touchdown number five for Chris Bound, barreling in. Most points ever scored against Nebraska. Some respect for the Buffaloes. For everybody who doubted us, who did not pick us, we're going to Dallas. We're going to see Oklahoma and Dallas. Well, that's what really the disappointing part of it is, is because you come out there and uh, you're prepared and then things don't uh, go your way. Colorado uh, took care of the ball very well, didn't make uh, very many mistakes. And uh, we had some mistakes that really hurt and cost us.
Uh, that is an understatement. Most points ever allowed by Nebraska. They had 42 points and a half. That's the most. 28 and a quarter. Six rushing touchdowns by Chris Brown. Bobby Purify also had a buck 54. So 352 yards for Colorado's second and third string tailbacks <laughs> coming into this game. It's one thing to outpass Nebraska, to outrun them. We've seen that. Yeah. I have never seen a team go up and kick sand in the oh. black shirt's face like that. That was shocking. No one. No one has ever done it. And all the times I played Nebraska, we never could get a first down, much less do what they did. <laughs> but this is what Colorado did. They had a brilliant offensive game plan. They split the line wider than normal, and then split the Nebraska defense, and then ran for daylight. But another loser yesterday was Oklahoma, because I think as good as Oklahoma's defense is... They will have a much more difficult time stopping that kind of a varied attack by Colorado than they would the one-dimensional Nebraska team. I think Oklahoma lost also because they got to play that Colorado team now. Yeah, if the same Colorado oh. team shows up Woo. to Dallas, you're right. That is a completely different offensive attack than they would have seen uh, if they were playing Nebraska. I agree. The game plan for Colorado was outstanding. But Nebraska's defense... All the years anybody's ever watched Nebraska, these holes were 10, 15 feet wide that Chris Brown and Bobby Purify were walking up through until they got touched. Maybe it was the second or third tier of the defense once they got into the safeties. Gary Barnett deserves a lot of credit. Who would have thought with all the injuries that they've had, this team is 9-2. and two. They're going to Dallas with a shot at the Big 12 championship. Gary Barnett is doing a fantastic job in Boulder. Got to be the Big 12 coach of the year. Yep. You know, some of the Buffaloes said Nebraska didn't seem to want it that much. That Roy Williams of Oklahoma, we talked to you last night, said obviously Colorado wanted it more. That's a it big sure question, though. Why did Nebraska not want it more in that situation? Well, this result certainly will shake up any team that's expected to romp over the couple of final hurdles and go to the Rose Bowl. Miami is a huge favorite tonight. In fact, the last time that a Washington team was given this little chance to win, Paul Bryant was on the opposing sidelines against Don James back in 1975. Certainly a factor, Huskies are coming off a very emotional Apple Cup, making the longest road trip in college football, and their holiday bowl bid is pretty secure. And then, of course, there's Miami, 19 straight wins, and since that loss at Washington last year, Ken Dorsey's only loss as a starter, they have been motivated pointing to this game. For the second straight time, Miami faces a motivated, hungry Miami team against an opponent. This time, though, Shelley, it's a night game. This time, it's personal. It is personal, Chris, because there is no love for the Huskies here at the Orange Bowl. It was 1994 when the Huskies came in here and snapped Miami's 58-game home winning streak. And it was 14 months ago, like you said, that the Huskies beat Miami, effectively ending their national championship hopes last season. And amid all kinds of allegations that that game was filled with cheap shots, dirty play, the Hurricanes are both haunted and motivated. They stopped our winning streak, you know, back in the early 90s. Uh, they stopped us from winning a national championship last year. And those, those are two major keys that make anybody mad at you. Just don't get along. They're always knocking us off somehow. And now we just want to get back at them, finally. They took their shots when they, you know, they could, um, you know, late hits, that type of thing. And, um, you know, at home, they got a lot of hometown calls. Um, you know, they were able to rough the quarterback a little bit, um, hit me on run plays, stuff like that. The D tackle, uh, Larry Triplett, he played, we've seen him a couple times to be on the ground, he's on top of Kenny, just playing real dirty last year. Of course, they had late hits in the game. And, uh, you know, they were, were really respectful of us. And, uh, you know, they just basically left a bad taste in their mouth, like I mentioned. And uh, it's just not, it's not a good atmosphere to feel. Now, by playing this game now, Washington's offensive line, comprised of four freshmen, has gotten some very needed experience, as has wide receiver Reggie Williams, who was on fire for the Huskies last week in the Apple Cup. Uh, as for Miami, this is a place at night where Edward Reed says the freaks come out, and there's not a lot of freshmen who have been through that, Chris. Uh, they have a lot of freaks, Shelley. We'll talk more about that atmosphere and the buildup for that game. But here's the situation now with Nebraska's loss and looking down the road. We've talked about Oklahoma being perhaps hurt by playing a, a tougher opponent, Lee believes. But he also could be hurt because Nebraska's not going to be there to give them the, the quality bonus points and affect their computer ranking. This is very complicated. But Florida, Oklahoma, if they both win out. It's going to be very, very close. Skaters ahead in the polls. The computer average edge goes to Oklahoma. How big will that edge be? The strength of schedule, Oklahoma will have an edge, but that edge is shrinking because Florida has some tough games coming up. And obviously, the bonus points, Florida would pick up some probably by beating Tennessee. Nobody 
knows how much. Miami's the only unbeaten. It's pretty obvious we're going to have some controversy, Tony Barnhart. You're going to have a team in the Rose Bowl that has a loss, whether it's Oklahoma or Florida or Oregon or Tennessee. There's going to be some fans and some other teams that are unhappy. And if the deciding factor is Oklahoma's opponent in Dallas, that is just one of the weaknesses of this BCS system. You can make a great case for Florida, but if the Sooners get left out because Nebraska lost, that's a mess. Well, Chris, you make a good point, but you need to consider this. If we finish up with Miami and a bunch of once one beaten teams, somebody or something has got to pick the other team. Now, do you want a system that has some objectivity with the computer polls and the strength of schedule, or do you want it to be just the opinions of 132 coaches and sports writers? I really don't. Coach, you got to keep in mind, as long as we only got two teams playing for the national championship, you're not going to have a perfect system. Playoff. Yep, we're going to hear that word a million times next week. But let me tell you, as we both all said in this situation, at least one football team in that Rose Bowl is going to have a one loss, and that brings us back to last year. This is the worst nightmare the BCS has as to how to determine one loss team goes to the Rose Bowl. And, Kirk, you and I have been fortunate with Chris to see most all of the good football teams in the country. I tell you. There's going to be at least one or two really good football teams not going to the Rose Bowl. Yeah, there are going to be a few oh. deserving teams. This thing's just beginning to get ugly. It's going to get worse the next couple weeks. Miami obviously controls their own destiny. That we know for sure. And if we can assume for a second that they win their last two games, they will get to Pasadena. That leaves, of course, Oklahoma, Oregon, and Florida. You know what's amazing is if these teams all win their games that this is not going to be based on who is deserving, based on the merit of their team. It's going to be based on their opponent's strength of schedule and the opponent's records. At the end of the year, the national championship will be Miami against a team that is has a good record. Their opponents have a better record than, than these other teams. That's that, why, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's why I say it's controversial. Now, right. You're assuming Miami's going to win a couple oh, of no, games. No, I'm just saying oh, right. that's, the, do, simple, do, that's yeah. the simple yeah. way to look yeah. at it. If they win out. Yeah, There's nothing yeah. simple about this. It's going to be another one of those decimal <laughs> point duels that we yeah. had last year. You know, Oklahoma and Michigan certainly in must-win mode against their bitter rivals. The spoilers are spelled OSU. Oklahoma State and Ohio State desperately needing wins to stay alive for bowls. Notre Dame, Penn State, Kansas State, Pittsburgh who plays here in about 80 minutes. And has got some of those one-game seasons like the Bayou Classic down there, Grambling <laughs> and Southern. We'll talk about all that coming up. Miami, of course, more in the game with Washington. Bryant McKinney, one of the dominating offensive linemen, took care of Dwight Freeney. Now he's got the Huskies in his sights. David Carr, not just a quarterback, he's got responsibilities off the field as well. And Joe Paterno, known as a coach, his wife Sue tells us what he's like as a husband. Today's show is presented by Discover Card. Proud to be the sponsor of College Game Day. And in part by Tostitos Scoops, the tip lover's chip. Well, Purdue visits the Jekyll and Hyde Hoosiers, the last chance to win the old oaken bucket for the Indiana seniors, including the brilliant Antoine Randall L. Coach. Randall Well is the only 40 40 man in college football history. 40 passing touchdowns, 44 rushing and receiving touchdowns. Keep your eye on this ball game today because I think I use. Coach Cam Cameron gets his first bucket win, and let me tell you from experience, that is sweet. It took me three years to get him, Kirk. I think Cam gets him today. Indiana beats Purdue and gets the bucket. Yeah, and I think Antoine Randoel, arguably the best athlete in all of college football. Yep. He's been getting it done for years in Bloomington. Doesn't get the recognition because their team is not winning on a consistent basis. I'm with you. I think he'll get it done today. I think the Hoosiers win. Amen for Randoel. Is, is it enough to save Cam Cameron's job? Do you call this a JS job saver game? End of his fifth year, three and six, new AD. Uh -oh. That's one of his rules. New uh -oh. AD. New, o new AD. Oh. Maybe not then. All right. Maybe, uh, hello. <laughs> in East Lansing, the Spartans and the Nittany Lions vying to be the sixth bowl eligible team from the Big Ten. Michigan State clinches with the win. Penn State needs this one and a road win against Virginia. Starting quarterbacks return for both teams, and that's good news. Zach Mills for the Lions and then Jeff Smoker for the Spartans. T.J. Duckett's going to play. Is he 100%? Keep an eye on that. He wasn't last week. For Paterno's Lions, a chance to get back to 500 after the program's first 0-4 start ever. This could turn out to be one of Joe Paterno's most satisfying seasons. It's already been packed with a range of emotions, including tears shed after surpassing Paul Bryant's record, a very public moment shared with his very private wife, Sue. For an insight on what it's like to share the highs and lows of a legend, not to mention watch those famous socks, Bino Cook paid a visit to Mrs. Paterno.
What's it like to be the wife of somebody who's so revered as Joe? What they think out there really doesn't impinge on us. And I don't think of him that way. You know, he has dirty laundry. He doesn't hang up things, so, you know, these kind of things. I broke my hip in Spain, and I'm in the wheelchair, and he said he would unload the dishwasher. Okay, I'm in pain and everything. He opens up the dishwasher, which isn't a normal pattern for him, and he took out a spoon, and he said, where does this go? <laughs> I said, open up the drawer, and I told him. And then he took out a fork. He said, where does this go? And I thought, we're going to be here for an hour unloading one dishwasher. Uh, so why would I think of him as an icon? If there's anything that bothers him is when people think that he is something special. But he is. He's a remarkable... I'm not that good. He's a remarkable coach. A, a well, I wouldn't know. I never played for him. I would say he's very good at what he does, but that's not what... That's not how his family is about him or how he is about himself. The next big decision comes in, uh, in the 70s, the yeah. offered of the head coaching job mm -hmm. of the New England Patriots. Now, that's the one I think both of you agonized over. Am I correct in that? Or mm -hmm. We agonized. Million dollars. When the million dollars meant something. I knew it wasn't what I really wanted to do, but I, it had to be his decision. And I think maybe I unwittingly influenced him. Our last child was born that November. And I was up in the middle of the night nursing him, and he heard me crying. And uh, so he figured why I was crying. And I didn't mean to, it just, I thought everything's going to change. The lowest moment, it's, it seems, at least to me, from a distance in his career, was the defeat to Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. Everybody moped, and I was really getting annoyed. I thought, come on, get over it. I cared about it. But I thought, you have to turn the page and move on. Joe left to go to the Hall of Fame dinner in New York, and I pressed his tux, put it in the bag, and I said, here, and don't come home until you get over that game. So he got, went to New York, got all dressed up in his tux, started to get down, and said he went to Central Park, and he walked. He called me late that night. I said, it's OK. I'll be home. Now, this season, here we are. Mm -hmm. They beat Northwestern. Right. That ties it. Yes. Now we have Ohio State coming here to University Park. What was that like? You know, I really don't remember it in some senses. Somewhere I started to run on the field because I wanted to get there. I couldn't believe it happened. I was so glad it was over. And I was trying not to cry, but I think I cried. Oh, you cried. Oh, did I? Oh, yeah. Did I really? Well, see, I don't really remember. Now the question that Joe gets asked morning. Don't even question, ask. <laughs> and you get asked. Uh, I guess retire is out of the question. Who knows? We haven't talked about it. When the time comes, we'll talk about it. You've never talked about it? No. Nah. No. Nope. Likes what he's doing. Enjoys what he's doing. Um, someday we'll talk about it. He's going to coach five more years, Sue. So you know that. Oh, is that right? Do you think he could be around all day at home doing nothing? Well, I don't think he'll do nothing. We have a lot of things we want to do. I'm going to teach him how to plant mom plants. Get stuff out of the dishwasher. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, he said he wants to learn how to cook someday. And I pray that day never comes. <laughs> you can forget him ever learning oh. how to cook. That's a nice piece. Good job by Vina. Huh? Yeah. You know, I've known Joe Paterno now for 42 years, and I think his greatest asset is the fact that he has no ego, lack of ego. And I tell you what, that's not easy to do when you win all those ball games. Joe Paterno is the same guy right today with me with no wins than he had now with 326. The guy's lack of ego is what makes him go. You'd like to get to 327. He had no ego and no running game for a while. Yeah. But the Lions have unearthed that game. Uh, four and a half yards to carry. Ten rushing touchdowns the last five games. against. Well, if you look at Penn State's offense in their first four games and then compare them to their last five games, it's almost look like looking at a different team. They've improved over 200 yards per game in that span. Over 24 points per game. They're four, four out of five in, uh, in wins. It's a lot of talk about Zach Mills.
Mills, but there's more than Zach Mills. The offensive line has improved, the running backs are running harder, and the wide receivers for Penn State are playing much better as, a well, as a group as well. Bryant Johnson leads the team, 42 receptions on the year, 694 yards, provides that big play ability. Looks a lot like O.J. McDuffie. Tony Johnson, last four games, has come on, 16 catches, 343 yards with three touchdowns. He's now averaging 21 yards a catch during that span. I like Penn State in this game. You have to be careful. <laughs> See, Michigan State has struggled up and down, up and down, just like they do every year. This is a game where, number one, it's on national TV, so they'll come in, they're going to give great effort because it's on national TV. Second thing is they're looking for a bowl. They're playing at East Lansing. All these things, unfortunately, I think, I want to pick Penn State, but Michigan State has too much at stake here. I think they'll win. A qualified selection because the cameras they're are there for the Spartans. National right. TV, they'll give you good effort. That's right. They'll give you good East effort. East Lansing, too. That's right. National TV on ESPN, as a matter of That's fact. Right. It's our 3.30 Eastern game. Some rain showers expected in East Lansing. They could play into that. Also expected in Ann Arbor. We'll talk about that game coming up. And some showers also throughout the day in Morgantown. Pittsburgh must win to stay alive for a bowl in the backyard brawl. We'll talk about that Georgia-Georgia Tech game coming up. Another game we'll hit on Tennessee and Vandy. Philip Fulmer always gets a little bit uneasy when the Commodores are there. Rex Grossman putting up the big numbers, but that's not what's on Steve Spurrier's mind. What in the world is he thinking about this week? We'll address that controversy ahead. Game day Q&A, a much debated, very controversial topic. We ask a sampling of players, what is the best fight song in college football? I was a big USC fan uh, when I was growing up. So the, you know, just the USC, you know, uh, the fight song where they're playing all game. Kind of get chills down your spine when, when you're watching a game and you hear it. Growing up, I was a big Notre Dame fan, Lou Holtz, The Rocket. You know, I, I, Rick Meyer, I love watching him, and you know, I used to sing the fight song. I believe when I was in high school, the high school football coach even played the fight song for us before the games. I hate to say it, but Texas has a pretty, you know, nice fight song. It's got that little, you know, trombone thing. It sounds pretty cool. Florida State has a good one. I mean, everybody likes theirs. Everybody knows it. I think they have a good fight song. During the week when we're about to play them, they play it in the locker room to death, so yeah, it gets annoying. <laughs> Florida State is, that, is, is that no way. The chop? Is that the fight song? I've never heard Can any other song. Sing their fight song? Wait, absolutely how's not. How's it go? Hey, let me forget about that. FLO Saturday one. night, Knoxville, Rocky Top. Gets I love no that better than that. Oh babe. man, I love that one too. I, I like the Notre Dame one and Ohio State. Got and Michigan. Got yeah, come on, you're, there's one you're leaving out there that you really love. Deep said, down, you oh, love. Oh yeah, it's Notre Dame. What? You know what my most underrated fight song is? What's that? Buffalo Power. It hurts me you don't remember that. We talked about this, but you never listened to me. What do you got? Georgia Tech. Ramblin' oh, Rex oh, is a, a great, great very a great underrated one. fight song. We'll have to ask Tony about that in a second. <laughs> in the SEC, LSU ended Arkansas's run yesterday. So it's the tale of two Tigers. Auburn in Baton Rouge. Next Saturday, the winner goes to Atlanta. In fact, both divisions could be decided in many championship games, games that were postponed originally from September 15th, if... Tennessee gets by Vanderbilt in Knoxville today. They've won every year since 82. Commodores haven't won in Knoxville since 1975. But Tony, somehow just the sight of those black and gold uniforms makes Philip Fulmer nervous for some reason. Oh, you're right. As a matter of fact, I talked to Philip Fulmer yesterday, Chris, and he said he admitted that his team was not focused in that close win over Kentucky last week. He said he has had no problems this week getting his team ready to play Vanderbilt. Now, look, mathematically, Tennessee can still lose to Vanderbilt and win the SEC East, but that is not what Fulmer wants, obviously. He says he's looking for a statement game today from his team, and that statement, the Vols are ready to go and win at the Swamp. Chris? Against that Vandy defense, they better be able to put up some yards and points. Well, speaking of Florida, perhaps trying to spice things up on an off week or maybe fire his guys up for a big ball game that's 51 weeks away, Steve Spur used Florida's regular weekly press conference to fire some salvos at Florida State and make some fairly serious accusations against Bobby Bowden and his coaching staff. At issue, two plays involving FSU defensive lineman Darnell Dockett last Saturday in the Gators' 24-point win, a reprise of accusations made five seasons ago before the rematch in the Sugar Bowl. There was some 
plays in the game where uh, they intentionally tried to hurt our guys. Uh, their number 45 uh, twisted Ernest's leg, as we all know, and uh, he fell to pop in a rip, and he's out. He's out three or four weeks. Same guy tried to stomp Rex's hand over near the sideline. And uh, I don't know. I guess I've had enough of it. I've watched this kind of stuff for a lot of years every time we play those guys. Uh, when we play SEC teams, we never have any problems. But it just seems like, uh, you know, they got one or two guys that uh, play their own type stuff intensely trying to hurt players. I've never in 47 years had a coach accuse any of my players of dirty play. But I, this is twice he has. Sad, really. Well, Florida sent the tapes of the SEC and the ACC. Ernest Graham said he was even contemplating a lawsuit against somebody, which would be uncharted waters. I guess the question is, everybody's wondering it, what is the upside, Tony, of bringing this thing public and not just making a phone call to the Florida State Coaching Department? Well, I think you make a good point. I think the point is, Chris, there's work to do on both sides of the issue. At Florida, yeah, I admire Steve Spurrier for sticking up for his players, but in situations like this, the ball coach needs to turn the volume down so everybody will listen. On the other side at Florida State, Bobby Bowden, he shouldn't discount this thing simply because it's Steve Spurrier that's doing the complaining. He needs to take a hard look and see if he has a problem with this one guy. Coach, I tell you what, I, I think the commissioners of the two conferences need to step in, look at the tape, and make a decision and get it resolved now. Tony, good idea. And the American Football Coaches Association has a system in place where if a coach, in this case Bowden, feels damaged by another coach, in this case Spurrier, he can take it in front of the American Football Coaches Association. They investigate it, and if it's serious enough, they could ask the coach, for instance, Spurrier, to come in front of the Ethics Committee at the National Convention. Now, they don't have any power, but at least maybe they can say, you know, we don't like this kind of behavior, and they put a letter to the president saying that, not much power, but at least they have a system right. in the situation. Lack of ethics in this case. Well, you know Florida State as oh. well as anybody. We've all been following the Florida State defenses and marveling about them for, for many years. I don't think they encourage their players to play dirty, but I do think they teach an attitude in Tallahassee. It's an aggressive attitude that when the players get out on the playing field, the heat of battle, bullets are flying, trash talking starts up. Players are going to take things into their into their own hands. And in a lot of cases, you think about Florida State, they're great defenses. They intimidate their opponent. So if you want to say they're a dirty team, I don't I don't buy into that. I do think they are an intimidating team. But I think every defense in, in college football seeks that goal to intimidate their opponent. Because when you do that, game's over. So nothing wrong with the way they're teaching then? No, no nothing's I mean, wrong with the way they're teaching. And I don't think it's players, crystal clear that he was trying to hurt the guy on the tape either. Yeah, quite, but, as, quite as as much as Spurrier does. And I, I also attitude. think Steve, Steve made it sound like he was speaking for all of college football. Everybody who plays Florida State knows this and complains about it. I, we have not heard complaints, and I've been asking people, this is not a common complaint that's, that's being made and certainly not being made publicly. Aggressive attitude. Oklahoma looking to shore up a spot in that Big 12 championship game. It's the Bedlam series. Last year against the Cowboys, it was a real struggle. Colorado, of course, already headed for Dallas. The Buffaloes, with that performance against Nebraska, will revisit the storylines from both Nebraska and CU coming up. College Game Day is presented by Discover Card, proud sponsor of college football's premier pregame show. Hard-fought game in Kyle Field. Longhorns prevailed to go to 10-1, and one, and some Texas players told us they would tune in and watch to see if perhaps the underdog Cowboys can go to Norman and beat the Sooners under Bob Soups for the first time. They're 17-0 there under Coach Soups. Last year, of course, the Sooners had to survive that Bedlam series up in Stillwater, 12-7. Cowboys used a wacky defense, but the OU offense this year playing much better down the stretch than they did last year. On paper, this is a huge mismatch, but last night, Kirk, we talked to Roy Williams. He played the good soldier. He's talking about Tatum Bell and Terrence Davis, Brian, all the good players the Cowboys have expecting a tough game. Hi, he had me convinced this <laughs> It's going to be a tight game today. Oklahoma's defense right now is playing as well as any defense in college football. You realize that 28 of the last 33 series against Oklahoma defense have been three and out. 
Look at the last two weeks, what they've done to teams. They've only allowed five first downs in the second half against Texas A&M and Texas Tech. They're doing it with speed and an aggressive attitude. We've seen it over the last few years with Mike Stoops as a defensive coordinator in Norman. They fly around. They have great experience, but newcomers, guys like Teddy Lehman, number 11, who took over for Torrance Marshall, have stepped up and allowed this defense to not miss a beat. And of course, of course, when you have Roy Williams back there, who at times will walk up and be a fourth linebacker in their scheme, allows them to be a little bit more aggressive and take a few more chances. Oklahoma State's only chance in this game is if Oklahoma were to overlook the Cowboys after what happened yesterday to Nebraska with Colorado and combine that with the fact that this game was close, as Chris mentioned last year, no chance. Oklahoma <laughs> comes out yeah. ready and wins big on their way to Dallas in a Big you know, 12 title. Oklahoma State's uh, <laughs> big, right? No chance? All right. Oklahoma State's <laughs> new head football coach, Les Miles, has done a nice job for the Cowboys. Remember, he only lost by three points to that great Colorado team we were just looking at. Now, Oklahoma's defense is so strong, Oklahoma's only chance to score Oklahoma State, in my mind, is with the kickoff return. <laughs> they got Chris Massey. He leads the nation in that, and I think he's going to get lots of chances. <laughs> I think Oklahoma, big. I mean, really big on this one. If Oklahoma loses its Texas, Colorado, and Dallas, Mac Brown talking about a Big 12 South co-championship. Bob Soup says, I don't, I don't yeah. think he, he yeah. looked at the tiebreaker. No chance. I didn't know Sooners win. A crown. They go to Dallas. No well, and you live up there in the college football stratosphere, like the Oklahomas and Nebraskas. You have high goals and you have big dreams. And the nature of the sport, it can all go bye-bye very suddenly. You catch a hot team, you forget to bring your A game. The hot team yesterday was Colorado. And they had been ripped locally that Gary Barnett taken apart after a loss to Fresno his slogan return to dominance had been mocked no mocking right now Steve Cyphers reports from Boulder on the suddenly changing fortunes on both sides Here comes Brown again touchdown six touchdowns for Brown the Buffaloes are going to Texas no doubt about it now it was just a matter of who wanted it more and like I said Nobody in the country gave us a chance to do what we did this weekend. So, you know, we shocked the world. We knew we could beat Nebraska. Everybody else didn't do it. We believed in ourselves, and we knew we could do it. For all the Colorado chaos, for all the Rocky Mountain madness on the field long after the game was over, it was a quiet, perhaps a disbelief, not 30 yards away. It's really tough to talk about because that really never happens to us. Um, you know, I can't remember the last time that uh, somebody put that many points uh, against us. I would never have thought that anyone in the, in the country could run the ball on us. And they did a good job of running the ball on us, and I was just shocked. I don't think shocked is, uh, is maybe the right word because um, uh, it can happen to anybody. Uh, but uh, we had played so well throughout the course of the year that I did not see this game getting out of hand. You can't lay it on just one factor. I think, you know, we, we, we come in this, this game as a team and we're leaving it as a team, so we're not blaming it on, you know, just the run. You know, it was a lot of things that everybody could have done to make this game a lot different, so we just got to take it in stride. Taking it in stride would seem to be virtually impossible. This was an undefeated Nebraska team, number one in the BCS rankings. But that was before the Buffs ran roughshod over the nation's sixth-ranked defense to leave the Huskers at 11-1 and, and out of the Rose Bowl. But if Solich gets his way, not out of the BCS bowl picture completely. I don't think there's any question at 11-1, and one, we ought to be looked at uh, very seriously. I think we still had a great season. I, um, it, it, it sucks that, you know, the national title run is over and everything, but at the same time, we just got to bounce back off of this loss. In Colorado? It knows when it plays next, a week from today in the Big 12 Championship in Dallas. We talked about getting to this championship game since last July, and so I knew it was important to them, and I knew they'd play hard. You have plenty left for the championship. Oh, we have plenty left. You know, we're ready. We're going to celebrate this one tonight, and then we're going to get prepared for Oklahoma. Congratulations. I got Thank one you. more thing to say. Damn. For everybody who doubted us, who did not pick us, we're going to Dallas. We're going to beat Oklahoma and Dallas. Graham may be jumping the gun on naming his championship opponent, but as he and the Buffaloes know all too well, that happens. In Boulder, Steve Cyphers, ESPN. We Kirk all, says we Daniel's all, not jumping again. We all believed. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, weren't, you weren't none among the doubters. Uh, we, I thought it would be a tight game. This could have big-time implications, though, in the Big 12 BCS Bowl. Obviously, if Oklahoma beats Colorado, they're going to get that uh, Rose Bowl. Well, not obviously, but they're going to get to a BCS Bowl game. That means that uh, Texas or Nebraska get left out. If Colorado pulls the upset, two of those three teams, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Texas, going to get left out of BCS Bowls. No way. It's going to happen. It can't be. Let it's me tell you be. something. I, of all the games that we've seen, 
the Big 12 this year to me has taken over for the SEC as the best conference from the top to the bottom. And if I was a BCS Bowl director, I would take Nebraska, and I'll tell you why. Nebraska takes thousands. I mean thousands. I mean thousands of people and puts them in a seat and they spend money when they get there. I'd take Nebraska, the BCS. As good as the Big 12 has been this year, and they are terrific, the SEC has taken a little bit of a dip. I think the Pac-10 still has a strong argument for being considered the best conference this year in college football. As far as the argument about the Big 12 and who will be the other team, assuming Oklahoma and Colorado play in this Big 12 championship game, who will be the, the team on the outside? I think it's going to be Nebraska on the outside because Texas is the X factor. Texas Texas 10 and 1 is very attractive to the BCS, very similar to Nebraska. But what's different is Texas hasn't been to the big dance. They have not been to the BCS. So 10 and 1, great history. They turn on the TV sets and they bring thousands and thousands of people and they spend lots of money at Texas. <laughs> they do. They bring big wallets. They bring big wallets. And they're going to bring in to Bourbon Street. I just get the feeling. Oh, but but could be. you got Cotton and Holiday, two bowl games doing it. Very, very high quality oh, yeah. Big 12 teams out of this. Look at oh, man, we'll kill them. Washington. Yeah, that's right. Colorado, the only Big 12 team Bob Soups hasn't beaten. Just file that away. Yes, keep it in mind. Steve Bellisari, not likely to play as Buckeyes take on Michigan and Notre Dame take it on Stanford. Must win for Bob Davey and the Irish in Palo Alto this evening. <laughs> ESPN Classic Tradition is brought to you by Tostito Scoops, the dip lover's chip. Well, the historical backdrop for tonight's Washington-Miami game is about a lot more than last year's Washington win on Husky Stadium. The bad blood first flowed a decade ago when the teams were unbeaten and split controversial national championships. The freshmen on those teams in 1994, they were seniors. When a Washington team that had lost to Keyshawn Johnson and USC in the opener was 1-1, one one, ranked 19th in the country on bowl probation, pulled off the upset known in the Northwest as the Whammy in Miami. The most shocking few minutes in hurricane football history against the likes of Warren Sapp and Ray Lewis. Coming to the Orange Bowl is our home, our doghouse, and nobody comes in to beat us. Nobody. It hadn't happened in 476 weeks. Miami was a 15-point favorite against Washington in 1994, looking to extend its record home winning streak to 59 in a row. Miami's defense would be tested by All-American running back Napoleon Kaufman, but the rock-solid Canes D had yet to allow a touchdown in his first two games. We have to shut him down. We have to wrap up. Everyone has to play the football and tackle him. If he gets his yards, then he gets his yards. But right now, I'm not giving him, not spotting him any yards. No, that's the orange ball. The Canes took a 14-3 halftime lead on this bomb from Frank Costa to Yatiel Green, and it looked like Miami was on its way. The Canes had not blown a seven-point lead in an astounding 112 games. But Washington wasted no time in mounting a comeback. Less than a minute into the second half, this screen pass from Damon Heward to Richard Thomas turned into a 75-yard touchdown. Four plays later, the Husky defense got in the end zone. Costa against the blitz, gets his pass off, intercepted. 30-25, this is going to go for six. The 10, the 5, touchdown Washington. Washington scored its third touchdown in less than five minutes when Heward's fumble into the end zone was recovered by offensive lineman Bob Sapp. We're not the Irish or nothing, but, uh, you know, someone else was watching over us, and, and uh, thank God. It was that five-minute stretch that would end the streak at 58. The longest home-winning streak in NCAA history is just that, history. Though the Canes would then run the table and get back to the Orange Bowl, that one quarter ruined any chance of a perfect season. I don't um, say our season is 10-1. and one. Our season in 10 and 5 minutes, because that's 5 minutes that hurt us. The win was especially sweet for Husky coach Jim Lambright, whose team had split the 91 national title with the Canes. For all of those who played on the 91 Husky football team, we validated this ring a little bit. Flash that jewelry up there. Nice. 22 points in five minutes, 25 in the quarter. That Miami team did not allow 25 points in any other game that season. But Washington? 
they, they said they over-conditioned for Miami early on. They kind of fell apart late in the season. That Husky team finished up at 7-4. and four, just on what's, historical what's amazing is the, the Hurricane players from today, not only last year's game, but they're using that game yeah, that's, as motivation. That's how much that affected the Miami program. Part of that legacy. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're going to turn around the microphones. We usually have questions for you guys from fans. Now we get a chance to hear what some of the top players in the country want to know from you guys. Good. This will be interesting. Yeah. A. Lee, how did it feel a couple weeks ago to have to put on the Ibis hat and predict the University of Miami to beat the Florida State Seminoles at Florida State? <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> In fact, they kicked me out of the Florida State Letterman's <laughs> Club. They said bad words to me. I couldn't believe it. But let me tell you something. I felt that that kid there, Dorsey, was the difference between Miami and Florida State, and I didn't want to prostitute my integrity, and that's why I picked Miami to beat Florida State. Do they take those those plaque out of the Hall of Fame for you? That's yeah, exactly what they oh did. <laughs> Come on. Back There's the every year to pick against Florida State. Oh. This is the year. Question number two. Uh, Kirk, I, I've got a question. Uh, my name is Joey from Eugene. Uh, how do you decide between the, the one lost teams in the country? You've got Florida who lost early in the season and uh, I guess Oregon, who lost midseason, Texas lost midseason, and, and Nebraska lost late. You've got a bunch of one loss teams. How do you uh, decide who goes to the national championship game? <laughs> oh, man, you guys are throwing me a curveball here. A live question from Joey. I, I think, Joey, it's going to come down to the computers. I think that you look at strength of schedule, and you know this. You've already written this down on a blackboard somewhere in one of your meeting rooms. It's going to come down to strength of schedule and the computer ranks, the rankings to find out. Who, in fact, will be the last team standing with all these one-loss teams? Good question from our next guest. It, and, Joe, you hang in there. We're going to ask some questions. For, maybe we'll ask you who should play <laughs> in the yeah, turn around championship game. Yeah. Yeah. We'll turn it around. Okay, Joe, okay. hang in there. Question for these guys all week on ESPN.com, Lee Mail, and QB Mail. We'll talk to Joey Harrington. We'll deal with David Carr, quarterback from Fresno State. Up a victory. They are headed to a bowl game. And He's had to do a diaper changing sometimes. Look at that. Look at the right arm and the little guy. Little bit. Let the go. Let the, uh, the future Fresno State quarterback as well. On Campus is presented by Outback. Proud sponsor of the 2002 Outback Bowl. Well, Fresno State took care of San Jose State at 10-2. The Bulldogs headed to the San Jose, or... Silicon Valley Classic in San Jose on New Year's Eve. David Carr finishing with 36 touchdown passes, seven interceptions on the season. He, of course, became a star with the upsets early for the Bulldogs. NFL scouts already knew plenty about him. And for folks in the Valley, they had already grown to love him as a quarterback, a teammate, and a devoted family man. Here's Curry Kirkpatrick on a guy who's adept at dealing with changing defenses and changing diapers. He's a multitask person. That's the best way to really put him. He can handle a lot of different things at once. When he comes home from school, he'll try and play with Austin for a little bit, and then he'll watch some film. I always eat dinner with my family, my wife and my little boy. And if I'm doing some homework, too, I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm writing with one hand and playing catch with the other hand. As prolific a quarterback as David Carr is on the field, he's equally as versatile off it. Through a season of Fresno State barging into the national spotlight, the Bulldogs' homeboy has juggled his football, his family, and his faith in a skilled balancing act that reflects the maturity and responsibility expected of a genuine superstar. We went to a church camp and we met there. It was real serious and, um, you know, different from any other boyfriend that I had ever had. And um, we knew that we would want to get married someday. And so they did. But only after David, a heartsick sophomore of 19 at the time, recovered from the blues and some mixed blessings from his coach. Yeah, it was a rough time. I was leaving home. I was leaving a lot of my friends back in Bakersfield. I was leaving my girlfriend, who I, I loved. Coach was like, David, come on. There'll be other girls in your life. And well, that wasn't too good for you. No, it wasn't too good for me, but he didn't know me then. So hopefully now his feelings have changed. I think they have. Uh, she's a great girl. You should. You really get to know her, you can see why David's what he is. When Austin came, were you happy as a boy? I think we were both happy to have a boy. It was just something that happened, and I knew that we wanted to do it eventually, and, you know, I got married young, why not start a family young, too? So he was really excited to have his own little football player. Now you taught him the stance. We were at home, and I was playing football with him, and I just said, sit up, like this, and he dropped down to a three-point stance, and <laughs> I was like, I think we're onto something here. They have fun, and they like to tackle him, and. We're out at practice, and Austin will be tackling all these other little babies that are out there. 
When you're a student, a husband, a father, and a probable first-round NFL draft pick, you've obviously got a whole lot on your plate. When you're David Carr, however, that plate is not quite full. By day, Carr practices his drops. At night, he helps Melody pick up the droppings. I get them done real quick. I mean, you don't, no wasted movement, you know? He doesn't want to be on the table, and I don't want to be there. Stinky diapers, you know, he'll, he'll do it if he has to, but he'd rather not. You know, he gets a little look on his face like he's delivering something to us, so I kind of, Mom, can you come over here and help us out? On Thanksgiving, both sides of the Carr family gathered in Fresno for the kind of intimate scene that the quarterback's boyhood bulldog idol could relate to. My simple advice has been to just love and cherish his wife and baby and, and to take care of them and, and uh, use them as an escape uh, from the pressures that go along with football. I just talked to him the other day about just life and spend more time with your wife, send your wife flowers on the way, on your way back from a road game. Yeah, I told him it might be a good idea to send his wife some roses. It, uh, it, it, might, uh, it might let his time at home be a little more uh, well spent. She's been a real help for me as well as my son because when I come home, my son doesn't know if we win or lost. He just knows that it's time to play football with Dad. That's cute, teaching them the three-point stance. Is that Ty and Jake? Have you taught them the three-point stance? No, they're right here. They're, 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 they're right here. They're right here. Yeah. 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 I like that. Yeah. Smack them around. Work with Curry bit. on his form, though. <laughs> okay. Young Austin is not going to have to wear hand-me-downs, though, because David Carr, scouts know about him. He's going to make a lot of money in the NFL. Yeah, I think he'll be OK. okay. I, I think the, the young man will be OK. I, I've talked with a lot of NFL personnel. We see him out at a lot of these games. and. Uh, there's a strong interest in, in both David Carr and Joey Harrington. Most people believe these are the top two quarterbacks uh, in all of college football. And in fact, when it comes to the draft, you look at the Houston Texans, Dom Capers and Chris Palmer, who's the offense coordinator, really like David Carr and like the intangibles that he brings to the table, not just the physical attributes, but he really has that, uh, that blue-collar attitude that, that you like to see out of a leader. And when you sit him down and interview him, I imagine he comes across as yeah, a pretty mature sure guy, does. which they certainly like to see. As you mentioned, if Carr is not the first quarterback taken in the NFL draft. Our next guest will be Joey Harrington from his folks home in Portland. He's got a Thanksgiving story to tell us. He's nine pounds heavier than he was at the start of the weekend. <laughs> Well, how tough is that Pac-10? How deep is it, as Kirk was talking about? Consider Stanford, 7-2, and two, number 9 of the BCS, 6th toughest schedule, beat Fiesta Bound Oregon, routed Boston College, likely headed to the Seattle Bowl against maybe Georgia Tech or some ACC team. 4-5, and five, Notre Dame is headed nowhere unless the Irish beat the Cardinal in Palo Alto and then beat Purdue on the road. Big performances as an underdog, no longer a hallmark for Notre Dame. Bob Davey, 1-11 for 11 on the road against ranked teams, especially ones at night he's had trouble. Actually, there's a twilight kickoff, which many Irish fans believe might be fitting. It's also the twilight of Randy Fasani's career. He got into one play against Cal, scrambled, looked pretty good, so he's going to return as starting quarterback, the word is, at Stanford. Mistake. Big mistake. Big mistake. Yes, sir, because huh? I'm telling you, Chad Lewis at, at quarterback at Stanford has beaten the following teams. Oregon, UCLA, Arizona, and California. They're number one in the Pac-10 in scoring, and they do it with a balanced offense and throwing the football deep. This kid, Lewis, is a winner. Now, if you watch number 10, Lewis, as he goes back, he throws a really nice shot here in a concentration by number six, Luke Powell. It's sensational. But this is my favorite, Kirk. Watch this. You'll love it. Watch the post corner, left-hand corner. Nice touch. Nice. Touch, touchdown. Now, if Stanford plays quarterback Randy Fasani, I'm telling you, Notre Dame's going to win the game. Huh? Uh, they'll win the game. If Chad, I mean, if Chris Lewis plays, Stanford wins the game. Simple as that. Wow. Telling you, you got against Fasani. You know, nothing. He's love, Italian too, but I'm going with Lewis. <laughs> I love Randy Fasani. If he's healthy, no he can way. be out there. It's not a matter of who the quarterback. It doesn't matter who the quarterback is. Notre Dame can't match up very well in the secondary against Teo Johnson and Luke Powell. That's the matchup to watch because Notre Dame hasn't had a corner taken in the first round since going back to 1993 when Tom Carter was selected in the first round. They don't match up well in the perimeter. That's number one thing that's going to hurt Notre Dame today. Number two, they're 114th in the nation in pass offense. They obviously rely on running the football. Stanford has the best rush defense in the Pac-10. Stanford wins big today. I don't care if it's Fasani or... Wait a minute now. He's challenged me. Mark it down on your calendar. We'll challenging take, you. We'll challenge me. Right? Challenge. Lewis is the winner of this game. Can the Irish Shatter get the Stanford Kirk. offense off the field? That's the question. That's Stanford number one in time of possession. Yeah. I mentioned that Stanford did knock off Oregon. 
bring in Oregon quarterback Joey <laughs> Arrington. Maybe he wants to make a prediction on the uh, on the Notre Dame Stanford game. Joey, thanks for joining us. So if your parents uh, home in Portland for Thanksgiving, you said you'd put on a bunch of weight. It was a Harrington family eating challenge that you just had to had to win. They told me you're competitive, so I guess you like to win everything you're in, right? <laughs> uh, it's my little brother, a couple of uncles, and uh, some cousins. Nothing big. I can. Uh, I can put weight on and off. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. back down to my, my fighting weight now, so. You put on nine and a half pounds, though, eating turkey and the stuff? Well, you know, little, little fixings on the side, too. You know, it's an all-day eating, eating contest, <laughs> so it's not, just the, it's not just dinner. I got a challenger. We're going to jump right in there. Yeah, Herb Street, he's definitely in your class. Let's, <laughs> we're going to just play the no-spin zone. I'm not going to ask you about the Heisman. I know you don't like to talk about that, but where do you see yourself in the pecking order of quarterbacks? We featured David Carr. We've talked about Rex Grossman, Ken Dorsey, some other guys. Where do you see yourself among those guys? At the top? You know, I, I honestly don't worry about that stuff. Um, you know, you guys can can rank us wherever you want but uh, you know I've said all along I feel like I put my team in a good position to win and uh, by doing those things by by keeping our team out of out of difficult situations I think I think that makes me a good quarterback um, you know I don't think the quarterback has to throw for you know 4,000 yards every season to be considered a great player I think uh, my job especially with the talent around me is to put our team in a good position to win I think I've done that this year joy I want I want you to speak from the heart here I know this is something that you you feel very strongly about Take yourself back to the Oregon State game last year. Very tough for you. You've dreamt of the opportunity to, to play in this game and to beat them. You get them at home. When you think of Oregon State, you think of your last home game. What do you think about? Uh, I think it's a perfect way to end it. <laughs> uh, I, I've, got a, I've got a lot to, uh, I got a, a lot of motivation from last year. You know, last year we had a shot to, uh, to lock up the Rose Bowl and, and we didn't do it. And, uh, in a large part, that was that was because of my performance, and so uh, not only is this a chance to to keep our, our our slim national title shot alive, but you know it's it's a way to uh, finish my career at Odson on, on a great note against a, a team I've always wanted to beat. You know, Joe, you've had nine career fourth quarter rallies to win football games, including three this year. What do you attribute to yourself and to your team the ability to perform at such a high level in pressure situations like that? Well, number one, I think it has to do a lot with uh, just the character of the team. We, we're a team on and off the field, and, and we really notice that when we're playing teams. A lot of defenses start chipping at each other or start, uh, uh, I guess, start getting down on each other when things don't work out. We never do that. Uh, we always trust each other in the huddle, and we've got such a bond on and off the field that uh, when we get in those clutch pressure situations, it doesn't bother us. We know we, know we can execute, and we, we trust in uh, all the players in the huddle. Joey, thanks. We appreciate your time. We, we're not looking forward to the Oregon State game quite as much as you are. I don't think anybody in the world is, but we can't wait to see that game after the long layoff for the Ducks. And even though Joey's not going to want to talk about the Heisman, we're going to talk about the Heisman right here. Absolutely. We're going to bring him in here and, and ask, uh, ask Tony Barnhart. Tony, we, quarterbacks have been getting all the push. A few mumblings about a guy like Roy Williams at Oklahoma, but how do you see things after Nebraska's loss yesterday? Well, Chris, I've said for weeks that I thought the Heisman Trophy was Eric Crouch's to lose. Well, guess what? He lost. And that may not be fair, but right now, I think it really comes down to two guys, Florida's Rex Grossman and our man over there, Joey Harrington. Listen to this. They've both got big games next week on national TV. And, Coach, I'll tell you what, I'll make a prediction. If Grossman puts up huge numbers and Florida beats Tennessee, I think Rex Grossman becomes the first sophomore to ever win the Heisman Trophy. That's a good pick, Tony. In my mind, in close Heisman races, I think regional voting is very, very important. And I think when Miss Midwest candidate Eric Crouch went out yesterday, I think those votes are going to the West Coast candidate Joey Harrington because they've seen Joey play in that time zone a lot of football. And those career victories coming from behind, I think now Joey Harrington is the number one guy for the Heisman because Eric Crouch is out and those votes go to him. That's interesting. It's going to be fun to see how it unfolds here in these last few weeks. A couple things about the Heisman Trophy this year. Number one, with all these games pushed back because of what happened on September 11th, if you're a voter, hold on to the ballot until the last possible second and watch all these games. And the second thing is base your vote based on the performance on the field, not the class. Don't, don't, don't hold it against Rex Grossman because he's a sophomore. And the last thing, I'm going to throw another name who's not in the mix, who you don't talk about, and it's Kirk Kittner at Illinois. If you compare his numbers, Rex Grossman, Ken Dorsey, Joey Harrington, and Eric Crouch, he's second only to Rex Grossman in yards per game, 
touchdown passes and total offense, and he led the Illini to at least share the Big Ten championship, and nobody's talking about Kirk Kittner. He's had a great year. Consider this, by the way, if Rex Grossman's in there, if it's close race, the Heisman announcement's going to come in the hour before the Gators might be playing that SEC championship game if he beats Tennessee. That would be amazing. I got my ballot right here, Kirk. I'm going to put it in the pocket Good for, you. Yeah. for a couple Good of weeks you. and I'm take your you. advice. I'm, I'm not going to touch it. I'm not either. After December 1st, and neither should any other voter, really, Absolutely. if you're going to call yourself Don't a serious Don't let the sophomore thing hold people back. We haven't talked about the Buckeyes against that team from up north, Michigan. The helmet game and <sighs> Kirk's visit with uh, Senator Jim Trussell is coming up on College Game Day, so stick around. You'll be proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially, in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Thank you very much. Jim Trestle's most famous halftime speech, and it came at a basketball game for the Buckeyes the day he was hired. Now, Trestle is not Jim Fossil, not even Jim Harbaugh, who once guaranteed a Michigan victory. Trestle made sort of a politically correct pledge, but somehow the folks in Ann Arbor are getting lathered up about it, at least some of them are, say they called them out, counting down to the game. Yeah. Trestle has this going for him, though. He's 0-0 against Michigan. So, folks, there have something else to obsess besides uh, Cooper's 2-10-1 record against Michigan. They now have, as of last week, Steve Belisari's .22. The Buckeyes visit the big house with a new quarterback and a bit of a controversy there. Couldn't we put the 2-10-1 away? You know, it's a Wonder new coach. It's time to... Never mention it again. Okay, that's, it. that's the last mention, hopefully, ever on this show. It's well documented about Steve Belisari and his career at Ohio State. He's had some ups and downs, and I think he had a chance to rewrite his entire legacy in his last two games against Illinois and Michigan. He had a DUI two nights before the Illinois game. He was suspended. He's being reinstated this week for the Michigan game. He has not spoken publicly since that night, but I did have a chance to sit down with his coach, Jim Tressel, to talk about the situation. If you go back to uh, the event when you found out, what did you? What was your first reaction when you had to talk to Steve? What did you say to him? Well, my first reaction, personally, was, "Gosh, I wonder if there's a problem that I wasn't aware of," and I felt bad about it because Steve, you know, is a model student. Uh, he's been a kid very active in the community, um, and you know, quite honestly, I was shocked. When you got to uh, to address the team on Friday after the event, what, do you remember what you, you talked to them about that day? Yeah, we didn't talk about too much other than the fact that uh, one of our family members had a problem, made some poor decisions. You know, they were as stunned, I think, as anyone, uh, as disappointed as anyone. Uh, but uh, I thought they rose up and played with excellent effort. We didn't do all the things we needed to do. Uh, you know, perhaps we were all a little distracted. I want to give you the opportunity to kind of explain why you have put him back and why you've shown the support because it's like anything in a community like this there's people on this side and there's people on that side but I want to give you a chance to explain the importance in not only letting him dress but just making him feel part of this well, I think uh, if, if you look at your responsibilities as I look at mine uh, my responsibility is as a teacher and a parent both and I think it's important for our guys to know that even when we err, we're going to be together. Even when we don't win the game, we're going to be together. And I think that's the way you build a strong family, and that's why we've handled it the way we have. When it comes to the game Saturday, will Steve play? It's unlikely that he would play. Uh, we're only allowed to bring the players that are eligible to play by league rule, and, and uh, you know Steve will be with us uh, because, again, I think it's important for him uh, to be one of that 64-man team. Uh, uh, he was elected a captain. Uh, he, didn't do some of his responsibilities the way that they needed to be done, but uh, he will not be a captain for the ball game, but he will be a member of the family. What people want to know in Columbus is if this game is close in the second half and it's within a touchdown, will he put Steve Bilasari back in the game? My gut feeling is no, he won't. He is a first year coach at a new program. You're trying to send a message not only to Steve, but to the entire team that if you break rules, there are consequences. So I don't think Steve will see the field today. In my opinion, you're either on the team or you're off the team, not halfway. 
I would not put Steve Balasari in front of all of those Michigan fans. The abuses he's going to get, forget about it. The guy made a mistake. He's either on your team or he's off the team. I think he's off the team. I don't think he should go with him. I you don't deserve to go. I disagree. The crime was very serious. It serious? was, a, it was, really a, was serious. more than a broken rule. It was a crime, and I don't oh. think he should play under any circumstances. But I think, you're right, you, you don't like the cut fact the guy loose. You don't I cut like the, the fact loose. they brought him back on the team, but I, I don't think he should be right. playing. Okay. Craig Krenzel, a Michigan native, a Utica, Michigan guy, is a very poised quarterback, but he's going to make his first career start in this ball game. He played okay against Illinois, had a couple of fourth quarter interceptions, but a lot is going to come down on him and a lot in that Buckeye defense. They're going to have to try to shut down a Michigan offense that is ninth in the conference in total offense. John Navarre is struggling, the running game is struggling, but they just find some ways. Absolutely. Forget about all the stats. This is Ohio State, Michigan, and when Michigan wins this kind of game, they win it the old fashioned way in the trenches. Now they stay around by running the ball and playing defense, and then they win it with special teams, just like they did last week against Wisconsin. Marquise Walker coming up the middle. Watch it. A nice little block punt with the left hand. Boom. And then Epstein kicks his the clutch field goal to win this football game right here. That's Michigan. All right, I'm going with this one. Michigan has not played well. Michigan doesn't look good. But Michigan puts it together, <laughs> and I'm telling you, they destroy the Buckeyes. Woo. I'm telling you, so they you destroy. say the speech back last year from Jim Forget Trimble. that speech. Forget about destroy them. One, of the, one of the reoccurring themes for Ohio State in the last three years, people blame Steve Bellasari, but it's been the offensive line. Luckily, he's been athletic. He's moved around. Now he is gone. Craig Krenzel, more of a dropback quarterback. That's the key to the game. The offensive line for Ohio State, will they hold up against Michigan's front? Michigan leads nation with four and a half sacks per game they put a lot of pressure on quarterbacks they better because their secondary is very average it's a matchup that ohio state wants to try to exploit it'll come down to whether or not craig krenzel has time to throw i think it's a close game i think michigan will win this game 23 to about 17 but it'll go down into the fourth quarter and it'll be a tight football game Good. buckeye defense needs to bow up mm -hmm. greatest right. promotion i've ever seen the first 7500 of the big house get this bow bobblehead doll. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. You can't have Bo, though, without bringing in Woody. Oh, yeah. right. And go at it against each other. Woody looks a little right. taller there. Woody yeah, wasn't Woody tall in real edge. life? He's got the All edge. Right, that's good. Good. Back to back. Slight edge. Not on the one loss record, though, that's I don't think. Good. Head -to -head. <laughs> good stuff. Speaking of Big Ten football, you got <laughs> Ron Johnson and the Gophers going against the Badgers of Wisconsin up there in Minnesota. That's coming up on ESPN2. How dominant has Miami been? We could throw a million numbers at you. They're number one in scoring defense, eight a game. They score 43 a game. They've had 30 sacks, only allowed two. That offense gains five and a half yards a rush, eight and a half yards per pass attempt. They even kick field goals well, 17 out of 20. If you're going to be that dominant on the scoreboard and the stat sheet, you have to dominate those one-on-one -on -one battles. When it comes to ombre versus ombre, Shelly Smith, Miami has perhaps the most dominant player in the country. Well, perhaps the most dominant oh, offensive line, if not dominant, perhaps unique. These are guys who love to bust on one another. If they're not picking on you for your big head or big nose or too much body hair, you know, they're prank calling their position coach at 3 in the morning and getting away with it. That's probably because they are considered the biggest and the best offensive line in the country, and they're led by a man who literally stands above the rest. Foot nine, 335 pounds, Miami offensive tackle Bryant McKinney is not exactly hard to pick out of a crowd, even this crowd. His height and girth have earned the Canes All-America the nicknames Big Mac and Mount McKinney, but his line mates call him something else. We call him Big Sway, and uh, just, you know, we talk about him, I call him heavyweight because he's overweight. We get on a little fat, and we get on him because he's, uh, he's lazy. Uh, some some of the jeans that he wears. About the jeans, <laughs> that was, um, my jeans are really tight. But nobody, not even the Hurricanes own trash-talking O-line, makes jokes on the field about McKinney, who has never given up a sack, not in junior college and not in two seasons so far with the Canes. I've never really thought about it like that. That was just something to me that you're just not supposed to do, so that's what I try not to do. I'm going out here every play thinking, thinking like a defensive end, and I'm just trying to counter every move they make. With McKinney on the left side and 6'5", 294-pound Joaquin Gonzalez, 
third team All-American on the right, the Hurricanes are considered to have the best set of tackles in the country. Brian with his size and, and ability, Joaquin with his tremendous knowledge for the game and work ethic, you know, both of them combined, I think they're the best tackles. It is very comforting. And, um, you know, to know that uh, they're, they're going to be fighting for me, um, you know, off, on the, and off the field, um, you know, they're, they're going to keep me protected. Both came to Miami through different paths. In fact, McKinney played the bass drum in 10th grade before finding his way to the gridiron and has only been playing organized football for six years. McKinney originally signed with Iowa but didn't have the grades. He turned to the Canes after junior college. At junior college, I was just learning everything. Then I got here and I practiced against like Division I players. I was like, oh, I think I'll be pretty good at this. Gonzalez, a Miami native, was a walk-on after turning down scholarship offers from Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. He's the type, he wants to work for everything. Um, yeah, because I know a lot of people who would have went to Harvard. Shows you he bleeds orange and green. Growing up, you know, I always go to the Orange Bowl and see these people come out the smoke. And, you know, I saw all the national championships, basically. So I've always wanted to play. I wanted to make this dream come true. And uh, it's unfortunate I didn't get a scholarship, but I think that's what made me focus and it made me, you know, work hard for, for what I wanted. Both of them have, haven't come from, you know, great programs or, you know, been coming out as blue chip recruits or anything like that. So everything they have to done, everything they've done in their career has been through hard work and perseverance. We just had, like, different path. Wasn't highly recruited too much, both of us, and just somehow just managed to come to Miami and just produce. It's easy to see why this, this offensive line's biggest fan, Lee, is Ken Dorsey's mother. I can understand that. You know, Shelly, let me tell you something about Miami. Their defense is so scary in the Orange Bowl. In fact, they're almost as scary as their fans that they have had three <laughs> shutouts there since 1956. That's the best record they've had. 241 to 10, they outscore their opponents. And they do it, you got to be kidding me, with toughness and aggressiveness and a whole lot of partying. But now, if Washington is to beat these guys, they're going to have to throw the ball deep. And number one, Reggie Williams, who caught 11 for 200. 103 yards last week is the key to this football game. He could get behind Miami and get an easy touchdown. But let me tell you something. This game is played at Miami in the Orange Bowl at night against those fans. Forget about it. Those fans, you know all about those hey, do fans. I ever. For, for Washington to come into this football game and compete, they've got to get the football into Reggie Williams' hands. It's going to be tough. You look at the Miami Hurricanes, best secondary in all of college football. They are also leading the nation in scoring defense. We know all about Ed Reed, but Philip Buchanan, Philip Buchanan, I think he's one of the best corners in the nation. He's had a great year, four interceptions on the year, two forced fumbles. He's also second in the nation in punt returns, 17 yards a return, and he has two touchdowns. I agree with Lee. Washington is a very good football team, but they're walking into a tenuous Ooh. situation. It's night, it's the Orange Bowl in a rare sellout, and the Canes are seeking revenge. That's not a good combination. Yeah. Miami's a great team, but I think they, they, they maybe have a little bit too much this this game. Huskies can be dangerous too. They're loose, nothing yeah. to lose, and a lot of pride in that program. Oh, yeah. Never they forget do. that. Yeah. A lot of pride in the line in the backyard brawl. Pittsburgh and Antonio Bryant must win to keep bowl hopes alive against the Mountaineers. We're just minutes away from that now on ESPN. Today's show is presented by Discover Card, proud to be the sponsor of College Game Day and in part by the new Remington TCT for total closeness even on the toughest spots like your neck. And by KFC. There's fast food, then there's KFC. We've talked about one game of seasons, the Bayou Classic and the Superdome is that, and then then some. Southern is the spoiler, Doug Williams and Grambling going for his second consecutive 10-win season. They'll play in the SWAC title game next week in Birmingham. A lot of meeting down there in New Orleans. Okay, with Nebraska losing, playoffs going to come into discussion all next week. In fact, I guarantee you, college game day next week will have a segment on playoffs. Oh, really? Okay. You're assuring that. That's exciting. Georgia Tech, big game tonight on ESPN against Georgia. I like Georgia Tech. Kelly Campbell's missed the last couple games. I think he comes back this game. I think the Yellow Jackets beat Georgia. All right, for Lee and Kirk and Bo and Woody, thanks for joining us. Pitt, West Virginia, next on ESPN. Wisconsin, Minnesota on ESPN, too. <laughs> Three